All right, today we're going to talk about a small collection of things that will help us out in our review for pre-calc. And we're going to begin with the difference quotient. This is not something that is new. You have done the difference quotient in the past. In pre-calc, you talked about the difference quotient. It will come back in calculus soon, starting today. And you will be expected to and you will be expected to remember how to use it. So sometimes you start with f of x plus h. This f of x plus h is just this small portion of the difference quotient. Our difference quotient is really this formula right here. So f of x plus h, if we wanted f of 2, we would put a 2 in the place of all of our x's. So f of x plus h using this f of x function that we were provided with would be x plus h squared minus 3 times x plus h plus 1. Now we could simplify this. x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Remember to FOIL when you are squaring a binomial. Minus 3x minus 3h plus 1. That's f of x plus h. But that's not the entire difference quotient. It is just this part. So to go on to do the difference quotient, we would do this whole formula. So f of x plus h would come first, which is x plus h squared minus 3 times x plus h plus 1 minus f of x. And we are subtracting the whole quantity. They told us what f of x was. Up at the top, f of x is x squared minus 3x plus 1. And our denominator, as you can see from our difference quotient, is just an h. Not f of h, not anything else, just an h. So, we can simplify this a little bit. x squared plus 2xh plus h squared when we FOIL. Minus 3x minus 3h plus 1 minus x squared plus 3x minus 1. And that is all still the numerator to our h denominator. From here, that h that we have in the denominator should always cancel out. So for that to happen, anything in the numerator that does not have an h should go away if we did our algebra correctly. So our x squared and our negative x squared should go away our negative 3x and our positive 3x, our 1 and our negative 1, should, should all go away. And they do. So we are left with 2xh plus h squared minus 3h all over h. We can pull an h out of the numerator. We'll be left with 2x plus h minus 3 all over h. Those h's cancel. And our answer is 2x plus h minus 3. That is the expression of our difference quotient applied to the equation f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 1. Moving on to domain. You remember from pre-calc, we have two domain rules. One of our domain rules is anything under a radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. And our other rule is that the denominator can't equal zero. We will add to some domain rules as we go throughout this year in calculus, but for now that's all we need to know. So, even roots, we have a radical. Anything under it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So for x, x is going to have to be greater than or equal to negative 2. So our domain for f of x equals radical x plus 2 is negative 2 to infinity. What you didn't know about our anything under a radical has to do with be greater than or equal to 0 rule is that this needs to be an even radical, meaning the root is an even number. When you get to a situation where the root is an odd number, like this g of x equals the fifth root of 2x minus 7, we can think outside the box a little bit. q 
can you take the fifth root of a negative number? You can. And you can take the fifth root of a positive number. So, the domain, when the root is something that's an odd value, is going to be all real numbers. Anything can be plugged into that radical, positive or negative, because it's an odd root. Now, when we get to functions that have denominators, like the two on the video now, we know that our denominator can't equal zero. So x minus 3 is not allowed to be zero, which means x is not allowed to be 3. So our domain is everything else. Negative infinity to 3 and a parenthesis because I'm not including the 3. And 3 to infinity. Now this next example combines the idea of a radical and a denominator. So typically, in a radical, that x minus 3 would have to be greater than or equal to 0. But, because the, it's in the denominator, we know that it's not allowed to equal 0. So we know x has to be greater than 3. And our domain is 3 to infinity. Now, let me remind you a little bit about some trig functions. We've got a sine, cosine, and tangent. Your sine value starts at 0, 0, and does one full period by the time it gets to 2 pi. It would go the other way. I can't quite fit it to negative 2 pi. But on that graph, our domain is negative infinity to infinity. Our range is negative 1 to 1. So the pi is. It goes as high as 1 and as low as negative 1. Cosine is similar to sine. It looks a little bit different. Cosine starts at 1, and it does its full period by the time it gets to 2 pi. So its domain is also negative infinity to infinity, and its range is negative 1 to 1. Tangent is the weird trig value. Tangent has some asymptotes. And those asymptotes happen at the pi over 2. So positive pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, and so on. And also at negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 5 pi over 2, negative 7 pi over 2. And between them, the function looks something like this. So. some of it. Now, on this graph, our domain is not going to be all real numbers because of those asymptotes. So, we could write that as all real numbers except x equals pi over 2n. which would give us all the positive multiples of pi over 2 and all the negative multiples of pi over 2. The range, then, of tangent is negative infinity to infinity. Moving on to the back, let's graph this stuff. So, you should remember that an absolute value graph looks like a V. And in order to graph one, you could make a table, or you could remember your transformation rules, which we will review in a couple sections, 1.3, I think. Um, but it looks like a V. If you subtract 3 from the X, one would think that would move left 3, but the Xs are confused, so it actually moves right 3. And your graph ends up looking like that for the absolute value of x minus 3. Keep in mind, if you can't remember your transformation rules, then you should just make an xy table. That will always work. On this next one, our absolute value of x is multiplied by 2, meaning it's stretched vertically by 2, and then 3 is subtracted from it, which means it's moved down 3. 
So zero, zero is a typical point on our original parent function, the plain absolute value of x. But if we stretch that by two and move it down three, it ends up at negative three. Zero times two is zero, minus three is negative three. If we go to one, one, multiplied by two would be a two, down three gives us a point at one, negative one. Put in a two, typically two, two. Multiply that y value by two, you get four, and then down three gives us a one. So you can probably kind of see the pattern. That's the left side, and as we know, it looks like a V, so the right side is kind of a mirror image of that. So that's what our absolute val our function two times the absolute value of x minus three looks like. Now for piecewise function, we just want to draw that graph where our x is located. So negative two if x is less than zero or equal to zero means our function will look like a horizontal line from zero to the left at negative two. And three, if zero, if x is greater than zero, put an open circle at zero and a horizontal line for all x values higher than x to the right. Now this is similar also. One minus x if x is less than or equal to one. Well, one minus x is the same as negative x plus one. So we know that it starts at one and it goes down one right one or up one left one. And this graph holds for all x's that are less than or equal to 1. So that's going to be this portion of your graph. And then x squared if x is greater than 1. Well, we know what x squared looks like. At 1, 1 squared is 1, so our y value is 1. At 2, it's 4. So this portion of the piecewise function would look like that. Keep in mind, piecewise functions are functions, so they should pass the vertical line test when you are completely finished. If they don't, check your work because you messed up.